Derby's new entertainment centre opened on the 17th of September 1934 and was an impressive building providing seating accommodation for 2,300 people. It is not often that part of a hillside has to be removed to build a super cinema in the heart of a busy town. But this is what had to be done at Derby. 8,000 tons of earth had to be removed to level the site before the first stages of assembling the 5,000 tons of steel, the million bricks and 5,000 tons of concrete which were to form the shell of the building could begin. The frontage was recessed between two flanking staircase blocks and set further back above the second floor effectively preventing any impression of heaviness which its size might otherwise have produced in the not very wide road in which it was built. Severity of line was relieved by the treatment in red brick and cream terracotta. Bright colour was introduced on the canopies and there are two sculptured panels at the left and right of the top of the building representing clown, pantaloon, harlequin and columbine. Six black and white marble steps and a set of tall polished walnut and glazed doors led to the entrance vestibule. This was paved with terrazzo and mosaic in a design which suggests carpet strips leading to the various entrances to the auditorium. The walls were panelled in Australian walnut and the coffered ceiling decorated in brown and green. The proportions and decoration of the auditorium, which seated 2,300 people, contributed to a sense of spaciousness. A deep blue-green dado formed a base for the graceful vertical lines of the side walls, which rose to meet the stepped and moulded ceiling gradually to the central lighting feature. The general basic tone of the colour scheme was brown, relieved with lines and touches of green, pink and silver. From the ceiling were hung nine glass light fittings. Six side windows used to be draped with green curtains and a tall crystal lamp in front of each. A hollow ribbed frame enclosed the proscenium opening. An unusual feature was the moulded canopy above the frame. Apart from being an additional decorative item, this acted as a reflecting surface for the sound from the stage. On each side of the proscenium were once tall lighting features. A Compton organ with illuminated console used to rise on a lift from the orchestral pit and the stage was fully equipped for the largest stage shows. The projection room measuring 24 feet by 17 feet, was faultlessly equipped in a modern manner with Gaumont projectors and a British Acoustic Films sound system. 400 flame-coloured lamps were used for the lighting of the proscenium arch, while the centre ceiling fitting, giving diffused light, used over 300. The huge 32 feet light fittings that were on either side of the proscenium arch were equipped with 120 tubular lamps each. It is a pity that the superb lighting of some cinema interiors has not been maintained, but the many thousands of electric lamps used in the decorative lighting of a building such as this were labour intensive. Bulbs do not last forever and the replacement of the lamps was a difficult, even hazardous experience for staff. Many were installed as the theatre was constructed, with the scaffolding still in place. Very little thought was given in the planning of the building to day-to-day -to -day maintenance. Almost as soon as theatres were opened, managements looked round for ways to economise. The first cuts made were with staffing levels, and as staff got fewer, so lamp replacement became more irregular. Increasing electricity costs also contributed to the abandonment of decorative lighting. When it came time for the theatre's wiring to be renewed, a far more simple scheme was substituted. It seems a curious paradox that now, 
when the sales intervals are far more numerous and prolonged than they ever were when the theatres were first opened and were so busy that the house lights were rarely raised, patrons might enjoy the enhancement that the original lighting gave to the building. But this is no longer to be seen.